Hey, what's up, folks? How's everyone doing? Uh, gonna be getting started here in just a sec. Gonna be doing a lesson with uh, CRA FB5. And uh, yeah, gonna be cool. Actually, let me try to get them on the line. We'll be on in a sec. Uh, subject for tonight's lesson. We will, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> hey, what's up, Sunny? Yeah, that. Sorry to hear that. There uh, should be a... Friday Night Fights this week. Uh, Sunday Rapid, I'm not sure, but we are doing a um, team match. Doing uh, Europe versus North America on Sunday. So that's going to be Rapid. It's going to be two games. Yeah, the chapters. Hey, Gratify, how's it going? Yeah, so if you're in the Discord, you can uh, find info to sign up for that in the uh, schedule. Thanks, Mishko, for the bits. Nice hype train. <laughs> They're just... <laughs> We're just waiting here a bit. How about now? Can you hear me? Hey, yeah. How's it going? Yeah, I had a little trouble getting my mic unmuted. Sorry about that. No, no worries. All good. Uh, how are you today? Good, good. You? Yeah. Uh, I'm all right. Um, oh, it's a little, a little echoey. Let me know, guys, if it, there's uh, there's an echo. Sometimes I have some sound issues. But um, okay, that's your end. That's your end or my end? That that would be on me. I would just have to okay. put some headphones in and figure something okay. out. Um, but we'll see if it's uh. If it's a problem um yeah so well let's start with like a quick intro maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself and what kind of chess you're playing uh yeah yeah i uh started playing uh, well let's see my brother taught me i don't even remember how old i was but i started playing tournament chess in high school um, in fact, if I did the math correctly, I played my first tournament game before Jesse was born. Um, so uh, I retired uh, about two and a half years ago, 
Um, and uh, I haven't been playing over the board in quite some time. I just got too busy with other stuff and whatnot. But uh, so it's been probably about uh, 20 years since I played over the board. But I, I picked up correspondence in uh, 2008. I played 450 or so over the board games, but maybe about 600 plus correspondence games by now. Um, and it just, it just kind of works out for me because my wife uh, started working from home about a year and a half ago. And my job kind of now is to keep the dogs quiet enough that uh, she can work in relative peace. Um, because I got, we got five dogs in the house. So, um, and they're all, uh, my wife's in the bedroom, uh, but they're all, uh, sacked out near me. So you see how that works, you know, but they're, but they're snoozing right now. So that's, that's going to be good. So, um, let's see. I started out probably about 1400 over the board and, uh, got stuck for a while at 1700, got stuck for a while at 1800, finally peaked out in the low 2000s before I uh, kind of semi-retired from that. So, you know, if you're looking for a rough uh, strength estimate, call it a rusty 2000. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, let me try to fix some of my audio issues here real quick. Okay. Um, just give us a second, guys, if you don't mind. Um, let's see if that's better. Can you say something for me real quick? Sure. Oh, great. Um, yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. All right, that should be good. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so, yeah, you were mentioning you've been playing a lot of correspondence chess lately. Can you tell me, like, what is your process like with that? Like, how long, you know, do you typically, like, analyze moves, and how does that work? Um... Well, uh, where I'm playing, I can use uh, game databases, uh, but not engines or, or in-game table bases. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'll do in the opening is I will go through um, my database, which is um, which I've kind of compiled myself. It's got not only the usual um, over-the-board games that you see in you know, at chess.com or other sites. But I've also got a lot of correspondence games in it too, high-level correspondence games from ICCF. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll go through that. I'll, I'll look at what's, you know, what's most popular responses. I'll look at, I'll try to look at what, what the recent moves have been. Um, I'll try to look at, you know, what some of the stronger players have been playing. It's mainly a way to try to get me out of the opening without getting into too much trouble. Um, occasionally, you know, if my opponent varies, that'll usually kind of throw up a red flag, and I'll say, you know, if it's not in the database, you know, is there something wrong with it? Should I try to, you know, should I try to do something about that? Mm -hmm. um, so, but you know, once we're out of my database, then I'm then I'm on my own. Uh, what I've had to do is, you know, even at correspondence, is try to slow down because um, my worst blunders have always been when I move too fast. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's like over the board, you know, you got plenty of time, but you blitz out a move and there's something wrong with it. Right. Um, so what I've tried to do is I've tried to take at least a day you know, after getting a move in from an opponent 
before moving anything because often I find that my my first impulse of what I should play changes if I if I wait a little while. You know, I just sort of let it stew and and so forth. I mean, to do that effectively, you have to figure out how many games you can handle without getting too rushed. Right. Um, you know, it depends on how busy you are and whatnot. So, I mean, I've got a lot of time, but I've also got a lot of interruptions. So I, I try to keep the game count down to, to, to reasonable levels. Um, yeah, the, and, uh, uh, when, when you're thinking about a move, are you having it like, are you setting it up on a physical board or just using your, your screen or? Both. Both. Oh, okay. Be- because I've usually got, you know, if it's if it's one of the more interesting games, I've got it set up in a in in a back room on a physical board, but I do most stuff on the computer, um, mm-hmm. because well, in fact, I'm sitting on the couch right now because what used to be my office is now dog kennel. Um, <laughs> you know, it's got the crates for when you know when we uh, when we when there's nobody home, they have to go in crates, uh, so. Right. Uh, I've got the laptop on a rolling stand and, you know, a travel set handy and, and, and so forth. So I do most things on computer, but I will often go back and check it on a, on an actual physical board. I find doing both for kind of, you know, critical or, or confusing situations helps me. Right. And are you, um, are you allowed to move the pieces around or are you just, Oh, sure. Oh sure. Oh okay. So oh, you're sure. like analyzing on your own, basically. Right, right, right. Gotcha. Right. I mean, you can do that obviously on a physical board, uh, but uh, you know, most site, most correspondence sites will have a, you know, like an analyze option, where mm-hmm. you know you can move pieces around on the board without it affecting the game. Gotcha. Um, when you get to ready to make your move, then it actually, you know, it acts for confirmation. You know, rather than, you know, obviously with where you're playing something at a much faster time control, when you move it on the board, you just move it. But, yeah. but they're gonna, you know, they're you're generally gonna confirm that you really want to make that move. So, mm-hmm. um, I don't keep, you know, notes. Some people do. Some people keep notes of, you know, they write out kind of what their plans are and so forth. I I haven't found it particularly useful to do that, but. Uh, yeah, and is um, is that the goal to like improve your correspondence chess, or are you thinking about getting back into? That's pro- I might get back into over the board eventually, but not probably not in the short term. But so the goal I think really is to, I, you know, I'd like to be able to play, for example, next year. I'd like to be able to play better quality correspondence than now. Mm-hmm. Um, and. Uh, I've been spending probably about an hour and a half, two hours a day on, you know, just various study. One yeah, what have you um, been up to lately? Um, well, I've been doing a mix of things. Um, and speaking of study, uh, you know, following um, Helstein is is almost impossible act to follow, you know. <laughs> He's good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna have to. I'll have to watch that on video tomorrow. Um, well, I recently went through Sharashevsky's Endgame Strategy. Cool. Mm-hmm. I recently finished uh, Rios's Chess Structures. I'm currently working on Helstein's Middle Game book. Uh, I've also got uh, in. I'm also in Volume One of. Uh, that complete manual positional chess by the two costages. Right, nice. Uh, recently picked up a positional sacrifices book by a Dutch IM. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've got some stuff going on chessable that I dip into to review and whatnot, like Woodpecker and 100 End Games and some visualization stuff. Cool. So you're you're so, doing um, quite a bit then. Yeah, good. yeah, I find the variety keeps me keeps me interested, you know. And and it's not like I'm doing it in one 2-hour block because, you know, obviously I might have 
a, a 10 or 15 minute interruption while I take everybody outside and bring them back in and Mm -hmm. or, or whatever else, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, it's on and off throughout the whole day because I'm not generally going anywhere. So um, that works for me. Yeah. So um, I, yeah, I looked through some of your games and um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask if there was anything in particular, like you'd be interested in working on or something you have, you have questions on. Um... You mean questions on the game or questions on other stuff? Oh, like any any aspects related to chess improvement, like yeah. Um, well, eventually, I I would be interested, kind of in you know what sort of recommendations you might have for what I should look to be doing next when I sort of wrap up some of the things I'm currently working on. Sure. You know, like what like what kind of books might be good for consider uh, as, as next in the line and that sort of thing. Um, as far as the games go, um, I don't know. I mean, my worst blunders there have been cases, like I said before, of, of you know, just moving too fast. And I've tried to really slow down. And I, I, I've improved on that. I still think I've got some work to do there. But... Uh, um, it's a little painful because I just uh, I just blew one game today. <laughs> Got distracted. And but, this is uh, you know what happens. Yeah, I guess with correspondence chess, you're sometimes spending like months on these games, so they're pretty painful. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. I think this. Uh, I don't remember when this one started, but uh, it it takes a while, you know. So, um, but yeah, you, you got to find what kind of uh, what kind of speed suits you? Um, uh, I blitz is just way too fast for me, and I, I found that rapid was even kind of fast for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I would probably play online classical, uh, except for I don't know, you know, when I might get interrupted in the middle of a game. I don't have to worry about that in correspondence. Right. Uh, so. Uh, and if I wait too late to when everybody settle down, then I'm probably just too tired to play well. Yeah, I would think you would need some dedicated time, like you'd have to schedule it out or something, um, where you could just sit, uh, like privately for like three hours, let's say. Um, but lots of people do like 45 plus 30, uh, so the right. full game is like, right, like two right, hours. right. That might, that might be worth a, a compromise worth considering. Yeah, one thing I'll say is, like, if eventually you do want to get back into, like, over-the-board tournaments, I would think the biggest challenge is just going to be kind of, like, applying... Because you've now played, like, a ton of correspondence chess and have gotten, like, I think a lot of experience out of that and just kind of applying all your experience and knowledge to, uh, of course, a timed game where I think the clock is definitely, like, plays a big influence on both people and... Um, it, it just like takes, let's say like a lot of, like a burst of energy, but sustained for that, like two, three hour period right. in classical. Um, right. so I right. would just say like, the main thing is just to kind of practice that, like that would be the one, um, piece of advice. Like I'd give, uh, if eventually you do want to compete in tournaments, I imagine just that would be the biggest barrier. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm happy to give you some uh, book recommendations as well. I was thinking maybe we would just like maybe go through a few of your games and we could just talk a little bit okay. about your decisions and okay. that'll sure. just give me a, a better idea. Okay, um, so I, I need to be in live chess and... Yeah, let me just send you a link and you can you can just follow that. Okay. Uh, it should take you to the right place. Okay. All right. Um, okay, let's see. Where do I want to start here? Yeah, there's a few of your games. Let's say I flag this interesting um, that we could discuss.
sorry there's a lot of good ones so i'm just <laughs> i'm just choosing um To, oh wait, there's one I'm missing. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't see you. Did it take you to an analysis board? It took me to. Um, it looked like it just took me to the play area where I would ask for a game oh um let's try again i think sometimes like it logs you in um go ahead and try the link again see if that takes you to the right that should take you to my analysis board yeah there we go yeah okay yeah cool um all right okay so yeah this is a game i thought was interesting i thought maybe we could start with this one i understand you play okay. these like Okay, some of them are like many months ago, so I know you mm. might not remember all the details, but okay. yeah. Um, I thought this was an interesting one to start with because I know you are also you're a big Winter War player with Black. So this is like the one opening where it feels like you're willing to play both sides of this position. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And sure. Uh, sure. Yeah, I guess is it is it something you just particularly enjoy? Like you you like these positions? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I um, I took up. I haven't been playing the French a super long time. Mm -hmm. Um. So, and I, I, I guess I was just a little more familiar with the winner than some of the other lines. I think that was probably it, but I but I'm happy with the position. So, okay, and well, let me ask you kind of a yeah, like more of a approach uh, question. Like when it comes to choosing your openings, because I mean, mm -hmm. um, I know you're working with a database, so you can literally you know follow any line. But is there certain types of positions that you're interested in getting? Like whether it's like you know attacking or more like you're putting positional pressure. Um, probably more, uh, probably more attacking. Um, well, at least, not, or at least something with some imbalance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's too, if, if things are too symmetrical, I, I kind of worry about letting things fizzle out into drawish positions. I see. So you want a structure that's kind of. Yeah, imbalanced. And um, so does that mean we're like playing for like for the initiative from the opening or more like, you know, we want to get like an advantageous pawn structure, like more space? Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I don't mind playing end games. I, in fact, I kind of like playing end games. Mm -hmm. Um. I went through um, crazy, crazy p person that I am. I went through all the uh, Averbach series uh, back oh, when wow. I was a seventeen hundred player, <laughs> uh, which is kind of uh, crazy. But um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, I probably. Would like a uh, probably would like a better structure, um, just because I'm I'm not sure. Given the choice between that and initiative, I'm not sure I would always handle the initiative well enough. Right, I mean, so that makes sense because you're, like, you've taken up the French, and the mm -hmm. French is an opening where, you're just playing for like the long term structural advantages, and it's mm -hmm. super solid and like if. If white isn't able to like attack you or pose any problems, then your position is like really uh, compact. So I ask this because like, well, here we're playing kind of white against the the winnower, and here, you know, it's really white that's like sacrificing the long term structure with these double pawns. 
Um, it's kind of a tough opening to play, I would say, uh, from both sides, actually. But um, a lot of players struggle as white because it's yeah, like... They're playing against themselves. Yeah, exactly. It's like you have to kind of justify your, your structural weaknesses, um, which is very doable. But um, yeah, I would wonder whether like you're fully happy with this kind of position compared to something like, let's say, uh, the Tarash, where I think usually white is the one that gets kind of a small structural advantage. And um, yeah, black is the one that kind of, I think, has to let's say, um, kind of catch up strategically. Right. Um, so yeah, that's that just my, be... yeah, my two cents on the repertoire. Yeah, yeah that might be worth uh, looking into. Um, so I know you had another game, actually, where you played the, uh, or you played against the Berlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe you went... For yeah, I think that the end game. I think that was a. I think that was a draw, right? Um, could be. Let's see. I think. Uh, yeah. 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 I wasn't able to. Um, but I guess my question Berlin? was, mm -hmm. like, yeah, is the end game something we really want to be playing, or, um. Yeah, I guess why go in for this one? Uh, I don't remember what else I was considering at the time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, maybe it's uh, well. You would you would recommend something else? That's yeah, I mean, what it's sounding like. <laughs> just if um, if you don't have like a particular reason to go for this end game, like you you know really enjoy the the position or the structure or something like that, it mm -hmm. I think it's a tough one for for white because um, you know, black is the one with like the long term strategic advantage. They have the two bishops, and this uh, light square bishop is a really strong piece. So, yeah, it's one of those openings again where white has to kind of prove something using like their lead in development. But, right. um, I mean, it's really not easy. Like, even, you know, world's best players haven't been able to prove anything here for white. So, it's, it's really a tough one. Yeah, I would think you'd be happier off, let's say, um, just playing d3 and just playing it like um, kind of like hybrid, uh, like Italian game, Rui Lopez. Okay. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, against a6, you're pretty comfortable with just kind of the classic Rui positions. Sure. I used to play the exchange, but that I haven't in quite some time. Oh, okay. So now, like, you're going for bishop a4 and then playing for, like, you know, c3, d4, or c3, d3. Right. Um, yeah, I think with with uh, fourth move d3, you're essentially going to be getting a very similar middle game mm -hmm. to that. I just think it'll be more enjoyable right. compared to, um, you know, banging your head okay. against the Berlin Wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I think when I did a preliminary uh, analysis of this game, I... That, you know, I'm, I think my comment to myself was, "I'm not the first one to to be unable to crack the Berlin." <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So I would, um, yeah, I would maybe think a little bit about your repertoire, just in terms of, like, I don't know how you you choose your openings regularly, but usually I like to approach it with the mindset of just like, what kind of middle game positions, you know, do you want to play. Um, and then looking for lines that can kind of get you into that um, type of situation. Uh, I got to ask you about the Sicilian. I don't think I saw almost any Sicilian games, but what are we, what are we playing here? Um, what am I, white? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm playing. Uh, I'm playing a regular open. To say in. Okay, yeah. let's just take one like, um, let's say Night Earth. Yeah. So we're going for open Sicilian and then usually going with like big main lines or. Yeah, I usually, at this point, I usually play uh, Bishop G5. Okay, so yeah, honestly, like this would be the last line I would expect <laughs> to be, um, let's say, like fitting the style of someone who also mm -hmm. plays uh, like the French and kind of more strategic chess. Because this one requires white to like, you know, be willing to sacrifice like three pawns out of the opening and then just playing with some uh, weird attack, you know, weird initiative. Uh, but I don't know, maybe you really enjoy these positions. Yeah, I, I I suppose I do. I mean, I I it's probably it's more. I think it's more familiar to me than some other lines, and that's mm -hmm. maybe one reason I I go with it. You know, it's 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 a residual effect of of back when I used to play over the board. You know, uh, I played that a lot then, and I just haven't looked to switch to anything else. You know, maybe it makes sense to switch to something else. Well, I don't know if you um if you like these positions, then I would say by all means uh keep playing them. It's just they don't mm -hmm. um they don't seem to suit your style. It feels like you are kind of more of like a strategic player, if I kind of read the games correctly. Mm -hmm. Um but I mean I think you should be free to play any openings you like. So if you're like a big fan of the, uh, like the poison pawn lines, then I mean, yeah, these are a lot of fun to play. And I would say absolutely. Uh, just surprising. That's all. <laughs> Not what I was yeah. expecting. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I've had, I've had some wild games. Um, it's not in this, it's not in the data of the games that I sent you, but years ago mm -hmm. I had a correspondence game that, uh, that, I followed my database all the way to the end of the game as white and a poison pawn. I nice. won it. And it was a win. <laughs> and that, I just had a better database than my opponent. You know, that's the only time this ever happened to me. Wow, that's um, funny. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like you, you can, yeah, with either side, you can, with this stuff, you can walk right into a buzzsaw. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give some thought to, uh, to maybe other, uh, Sicilian lines too. I mean, this is just, it's, it's, it's more familiar, I think, from, from the old days. And, uh, I, I've gotten to the point to where I don't want to try to spend any more time on opening theory than I have to because I feel like there's so much else I need to work on. Right. You know, that, that, you know, if you, if you get your, if you get your, uh, your, your black defense to E4 straight, then you still haven't dealt with, you know, like your in-game play or your middle game play or whatever else. And that, that kind of stuff applies to all your games, not just, you know, not just the openings that happen to be the ones you're well prepped for. Yeah, I would say there's kind of like like two main fronts of chess that we're trying to improve. Like we should be trying to improve um, our ability to get good positions. So that means like studying the opening, but more specifically like opening principles and the middle game, like how to complete your development, how to find a proper plan. Like this is the way you can actually outplay an opponent and get a decent position. And then the second front mm -hmm. is just like learning to uh, convert positions where you need to have like good calculation because at some point the game will always get concrete and sharp. You need good end game skill to be able to convert these positions. You also need good middle game skill to kind of understand, you know, when you're trying to exchange certain pieces or avoid exchanges or play for certain pawn breaks. That kind of all comes into like, yeah, execution of, of the advantage and stuff. Um, but yeah, so while the first part might not always go your way, you might not always outplay your opponent. Second part, that 
those kind of apply in almost any game. <laughs> like calculation, end game skill, middle game skill, they're much, um, much broader. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I just felt like I, I needed to work on those more, you know, so, so I haven't yeah. really tried to, to, to rethink my whole opening strategy. Maybe I need to do that at some point, but I mean, I, I was I just having, yeah, I was mainly just curious. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. But uh, it, it will be something to think about. Yeah. Especially once you um, start playing over the board, then of course you have to rely on kind of knowing, let's say the lines yourself. Um, then it would be really nice to stick to positions that you have a lot of experience in. So I would say you could play this even without, let's say, being super booked up um, if you feel like you have a good feel for the positions, like you kind of understand the thematic ideas and you can uh, just kind of play according to your uh, experience. Um, so... This is definitely a good time to be, let's say, just um, not necessarily experimenting, but let's say using openings that you one day want to see yourself playing over the board because it will give you a right. lot of like experience and uh, exactly those kinds of positions, which I think is, yeah, maybe just one of the most important things when learning any opening is just getting experience playing it and you know, recognizing there are different challenges in, in every opening, like in, in the Sicilian, sometimes you're getting checkmated out of the opening in the French, sometimes you get squeezed in the Caro as well, like you don't have a lot of space. So yeah, getting used to just kind of playing and solving these uh, these issues. So, um, okay, let's let's go through a couple of moves here. So this was a, a winner and um, so let me ask you this, after the game, are you typically analyzing it and, and what's that process like? Um, I went through all of last year's games uh, a while back um, and did uh, an analysis on them. Uh, not too much time with the engine, mostly just uh, kind of as a quick blunder check. You know, did, did I miss any big tactics for either side? Um, not so much to try to fine tune what, what went on. Um, although I, looking back at them, I, I think I probably ought to redo them all. You know, I, I think I'm a little unhappy with the level of the tail of, of what I did with them. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking of just starting fresh and, and Doing them again, uh, it's a hard it's a hard thing to do, you know, to 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 look at your own games like this. Yeah, for sure. Um, just kind of reliving reliving old old painful losses and <laughs> mistakes, um, but it's so important. And yeah, I feel like it's always nice when you. Kind of learn some idea from analyzing your game and then get to use it in in the future mm -hmm. um do you remember this game that we have on our analysis board much uh, um i'm not sure kind of like uh, winnower opposite sides castling and black just kind of got um oh yeah i just uh, yeah, I, I think I probably suppressed this because I, I, <laughs> I just, I just let that, let everything slip. I believe. Yeah. This was. This, a... this was kind of a, a a tough loss, but um. I, yeah, to me, it definitely stuck out because it, it definitely felt like a game where. Let's say after the opening, it was like we never had really had anything as white. Like black was just already overtaking the initiative after something like yeah. like fifteen moves. So it's these kinds of games that I think are the most useful to analyze because it's like okay, clearly you just could, didn't come up with the right plan out of uh, out of the opening. Um, so I don't know if you analyze this one at all. Um, or maybe you want to take a quick uh, look I, now and yeah, give me your thoughts. What do you? How do you think White could improve? Well, 
Well, trying to run the APOM like it did clearly just seems like it's too slow. Um, what am I going to do about... Well, maybe I should have... Uh, um, I'm thinking maybe I should have played... Uh, Played H four here. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if he plays, yeah, Peter doesn't seem to like it very much. But um, I mean, just trying to, you know, if he if he if he goes to play G five. Play H5 to slow things down over there. You can't obviously play H5 because I'll just drop the knight into G5, or or the or the bishop, drop a piece into G5 and clog everything up. Yeah, let's say um, um, let's say Black just plays in the same ways in the game. Just go C4, Bishop B2, and like H6. Right. Um Ian. It's kind of unpleasant, yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. I'm just. I'm just wondering if, when he finally does play g5, if I can play, h5 and sort of try to slow things down. But I don't know if that even works. Yeah, those two pawns will be pretty um, annoying. They'll be like f4 there, and that comes out. So yeah, I mean, I think yeah. the issue here is that black is getting. Uh, C4 in. And in the game we had right. like rook fb1, c4, mm -hmm. and, and basically two bishops here get um, pretty restricted, right. especially light squared bishop. Yeah. So, yeah, that leads us to kind of think that, you know, we should have um, tried to keep the position more open. Um, C4? Black. Can push so yeah exactly like one idea would be to go c4 yourself mm -hmm. and just out of just out of principle just to try to keep things more open black's king is on c8 so that's kind of you know closer to the center than your king uh right. and you have the the two bishops so this move i think yeah feels very logical um and the other move here that i think white could actually play like on every every almost every move but let's say here um would be dc5 which probably feels like yeah. so anti-positional better <laughs> like uh i could imagine not even considering this move as white um because it feels like the structure is super ugly um but yeah the idea is to play for mm -hmm some squares. So now like knight d4, knight b5 is a big threat. And um, yeah, basically like your dark square bishop kind of opens up here and you still kind of reserve the uh, ability to play c4 at any moment. Yeah, I think I like I think I like that even better than c4. Yeah, I mean this this is really really quite a strong idea and it comes up in some winner work positions there are other lines where let's say white takes and the idea is um like black has already played b6 and white wants to open up the b file 
Um, here, I think it's mainly just to open up some squares for white's pieces, and then like knight d4, if black goes a6, then you get the b6 square for your rook, so you can go rook b1, rook b6, and start kind of piling on. Um, but okay, yeah, difficult move. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes to even um, consider, but a great one to keep in mind because it's like you definitely could be seeing this kind of position again. Right. And uh, knowing that like you can, yeah, just take on c5 and, and play for this idea. Uh, okay, hopefully it comes in handy. Um, there was one other moment wanted to talk about here. So black plays here, and then in this position, um, we go bishop h5, and then bishop takes e8. Mm -hmm. So what were your, if you remember, what were your thoughts on, on making this exchange? Um, I was just trying to eliminate an attacker. I mean, I know is is bishop is is light squared bishops is not that great right now but um you know it's perhaps going to come over to the um uh to the king side i just felt like if i if i made some exchanges it might ease the defense some but you know maybe it's just too far gone at this point mm -hmm. um real quick thanks for the the raid velcro dot much appreciated welcome everyone uh, we're doing a one-on-one -on -one lesson here, just analyzing some games. And yeah, so, right, I think you, okay, of course, understand this is the bad bishop, and normally we shouldn't be uh, trading this one off. Um, yeah, for me, it's like, I mean, the bishop doesn't really have an easy time to get to your, your king. Now, your bishop is honestly not great either. Um, but yeah, you could use this one on like f3 and just kind of keep g2 secure. I think once we trade the bishops, then we just leave ourselves with kind of classic like good knight, bad bishop scenario. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of like white's um, white's nightmare. Like you could even one day get the bishop to d6 and then the bishop would be pretty good. But by then black is yeah also doubling on the g file and we have like closed position. So the knight is kind of very comfortable here um so yeah i don't know one thing i kind of noticed from your games is like maybe we're a little bit uh exchange happy like making too many trades right uh, i don't know if you have felt this but there are a couple moments where i thought we're trading but we really shouldn't be um, yeah probably so let me give you actually, let me give you another example here real quick. So in this game, okay, we're playing the winner where it was black. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, here your opponent plays this C4 and, and keeps things open. Thought actually game went totally fine for you. But uh, yeah, this one I found a little, um, little, let's say, unforced. So in this position, we end up going bishop takes f3, bishop takes f3, and uh, knight d4. I don't know if you remember this one. Um, yeah, some. I don't remember a lot of the details, though. Okay. I so, remember the game. I don't. I don't. I, I. I don't know if I can tell you a lot about the specific moves right um that, that's fine so yeah this is another exchange where i felt like mm, probably not great for us because well basically we're leaving white with like an unopposed light squared bishop and uh we get this d4 square now in the game white plays like c4 which i think is uh reasonable um they could have also played like bishop g2 and just let's say kept the light squared bishop and then c4 is coming to chase your knight off d5 maybe c3 first uh it's um quite dangerous you know against the uh the two bishops 
Uh, so yeah, to me it felt like, and really unnecessary. Like if we look at this position right now, White's nine on f three is uh, quite restricted. Like it doesn't really have a lot of good squares. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it just felt like we we're actually kind of helping White by by making this this trade, uh, even like helping them develop a little bit. Uh, so yeah, that's just one thing I noticed about some of the games. I feel like sometimes we're trading a little bit too easily, and it mm -hmm. can, can kind of help the opponent. Um, so the way I've always found it helpful to think about exchanges is to think about the pieces that are left on the board, right? You know, versus the ones that were that were trading. Um, and so. I think in both situations that could kind of help you or could have helped you avoid the trade because here it's like are right, you're leaving white with the two bishops the previous example it's like we're leaving ourselves with kind of like bad bishop against knight mm -hmm. and then that can maybe help clarify things whether um you know like a trade should be should be needed or not okay. um i'm gonna give you one more example and then i'll ask you to uh to come up with what you should have done instead. Um, okay, quiz time. Yeah. Because <laughs> first it's about like identifying the pattern and then you gotta work through the pattern. Um, so, okay, this was a uh, Rui. And um, so here against Bishop G4, you play D3, which I think is a very good move against bishop g4 because um, you're playing against the bishop and if you play d4 then black would have a lot of pressure against your center so knight a5 bishop c2 d5 took on d5 queen e2 h3 bishop e6 okay so here you play knight e4 which i totally understand it i mean it's like you're kind of developing the knight. Um, but at the same time, it also kind of makes things easier for black in the game. Uh, black takes here, plays queen to c4. You correctly avoid the queen trade because you're playing for the attack. And um, yeah, let's just see a few more moves here. So bishop b3, queen d3, you take on e6. Okay, this is definitely a good exchange because you weaken the opponent's structure. Um, but then knight g5 kind of allows black to, again, trade off the knight. And yeah, now I would say black's weaknesses aren't such a problem. So why is that exactly? Well, I would say the knight is a great piece for targeting weak pawns because it can shift between the colors. It can put pressure on e5. It can one day put pressure on e6. Whereas your bishop can really only attack the pawn on the dark square, so black's pawn on e6 is not like a real weakness. Um, but then a couple moves later, we actually end up also trading rooks and even like fixing the structure. Right. And I think, you know, black just ends up totally fine. Um, okay, so. And I would say up until this moment, you're, yeah having a really nice advantage, but we kind of end up giving it away, I think, because of the exchanges. So let's go back to this moment after bishop e6. And uh, yeah, I want you to just think about it a little bit and try to come up with an alternate plan or maybe another way you could approach the position. Well, it seems like rook to e1 is worth considering. Uh, trying to put some more pressure on the e pawn. Uh, also frees up f1 for the knight if we want to do a typical kind of Roy repositioning. 
So I would say my first impression would be rookie one. Yeah, rookie one is definitely a very decent move. What would you say White is kind of playing for strategically in this position? Well, and if you're looking for another point, maybe we should maybe we should try to open up the queen side with a four. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, we have um, you know, positional opposite sides castling. Here, mm -hmm. the most important thing is uh, the king safety, and Black has kind of already committed this sin of let's say weakening their king side. So, right. um, yeah, you have a very clear target here, and I think mm -hmm. A4 would have been the way to go. Um, yeah, just trying to open up the A file, and, and that, of course, will give you some, let's say, some mating tactics. Uh, if B4, then our knight gets the C4 square, but maybe bishop B3 is a thought. Maybe, you know, D4 might be strong, just like opening up the queen. I'm sure white has a number of good options here, but clearly this is... Uh, favorable. Um, so, yeah, I think this definitely would have been the way to play, and we kind of just need the right, I guess, the right perspective in mind. Yeah, like, what are we playing for in this position? Uh, kind of big picture, and then taking a step back and trying to figure it out, uh, like move by move style. Right. right. Um. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, okay, we're kind of approaching our our time. Um but okay. I I know we wanted to talk a little bit about like where to go from here. Mm -hmm. Um you mentioned some books you're reading. Uh I honestly like a lot of the books you mentioned so i would say just keep reading those like that sounds good um i think in terms of the openings that we're playing i think it would be helpful to just kind of take stock of like the positions you're getting and then just asking yourself like a basic question like do i like these positions do i kind of know what i'm playing for here or or not and then making sure mm -hmm. That like against every opening you have something that you like you enjoy like you look forward to playing it um and then same thing for like as black you know i i assume you're happy with the french which i think is totally mm -hmm. fine and then just making sure that you're choosing positions where you know you feel comfortable you feel like you know what your ideas are and you can kind of handle the middle game what are you playing against um d4 by the way um, I've been playing the King's Indian, but, um, I'm not sure if I'm really a King's Indian player. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I've been thinking I should look at, maybe look into some kind of Slav, but I haven't really decided yet. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I, lo I love the King's Indian, but, uh, actually a lot of people do compare it to the French because it's like, you get very close positions in both openings. Um, so it, it could work. Uh, I imagine you'd also be happy with some kind of like Nimzo or, mm -hmm. uh, Queens in the end, I think would be pretty, pretty solid and somewhat similar. Slav is also very solid. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I think it again, just kind of comes down to, you know, what kind of positions you want to be playing, whether you want like, say really solid structure or. You want some dynamics in the position, which which means some risk as well. Um, if you want like weaknesses in your structure, right. if you you want something simple, um, yeah, I think uh, at your level it's some important questions to ask because I think getting the positions that you feel comfortable with will definitely account for uh, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um. So. Yeah, I feel like that would be 
my main advice and then obviously working on you know your uh, bigger chess skills is going to be super important like working on uh, calculation and decision making like I think this is always this is just something that's like year round useful right um, I don't know if you had any questions on on how to work on that I, I do a lot of videos about it so I imagine you've heard some of my thoughts already uh, yeah 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 I think I think mostly it would be you know any recommended source material to start with or or uh, you know kind of add to as I uh, as I finish up with what I'm working on now um yeah okay let me let's think for a sec I'm actually working on a video about um about tactics books and like ranking them by level mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can find my list Um, yeah, okay. Um, one book, have you read uh, Art of Attack? I, I did read it, but I read it a long time ago. I have it, I could reread it. It might be worth it because obviously when I read it, I was not as strong as I am now, so. Okay, yeah, that would be one Perhaps. book I would definitely recommend because um, it, I mean, it has some strategic stuff too, like how to build an attack and this kind of thing, but it also has like a lot of exercises and like um, tactics in it as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you mentioned... Because yeah. while I was... Sorry, what's that? I was just going to say, while, while I was playing over the board and developing, I, I, I did read a lot of classics. Hmm. So, you know, but again, well, it's been a long time since I yeah. since I read these. So, so going back and rereading a few of them might not might be profitable. I would say yeah, it's worth the uh, worth uh, rereading. Um, another book I like is by Lev Albert, Tactics for the Tournament Player. I feel like that has a lot of like really practical exercises in in that. Um, mm -hmm. definitely not like a must have book, just one, um, offhand, I, I think would be good. Uh, but you also mentioned you're doing the woodpecker method. How, how far into that are you? Uh, I did the, um, uh, I started that back in, no I think November and I got about halfway through, uh, the book, um, doing their, doing their cycle method. Mm-hmm. Uh, since then, I've been dipping back into it every once in a while to do, you know, maybe another five new ones. And I've got it on Chessable, so anything that comes up as a review, I I just go through it again. Um, so I'm now up into I'm I'm up to about problem eight eight hundred and sixty, I think. Okay. Um, my my plan, I think, is to keep going until I finish up the intermediates. I don't think I'm going to try to tackle the the the, uh, the really difficult ones. Yeah, the intermediates. Um... The intermediates, I seem to get on the new ones. I seem to get maybe about half of them. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good plan. Around. I would I would suggest going up until the end of the intermediate section, and then just cycling through from the start and just like redoing them. Uh, I don't think you have to be like super strict about like following the cycles. I think just well, like doing the I problems. Went, yeah, I did it when I when I first did it. I went through you know the seven cycles or whatever, mm. and I got faster. But uh, what I think that did was that got me to recognize candidate moves faster. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know that it necessarily helped my deep calculation much, but. Uh, especially when you're doing the later cycles and you're trying to, you know, churn through them quickly, you're not necessarily sitting there and 
you know. But when an old one comes up for review, uh, I might recognize it and I might not. But, you know, I don't miss too many of the old ones now. Nice. But, yeah, you're right. It's, um, if, yeah, if you're kind of doing them relatively quickly, then it's not really pushing your deep, deep calculation. Um, so if you wanted to work on that specifically, um, then I think yeah, you I would, would try that. I would try that way with the new ones. Yeah, with the like the new, not... new problems the new or problem. um, yeah. the advanced section, like I would say those aren't like a lot of them are harder, but they're not like impossible and they're just a little bit like deeper than the intermediate. So that's actually would be a great way. Um, for okay. example, if you just did like one, like yeah, it's like two or three and you spend like like yeah. 15 minutes on them or so like without um without moving pieces without analyzing just kind of visualizing and calculating and then just comparing with the solution right. mm -hmm. um and then the really critical component of that um that i like to recommend is just once you see the solution just practice visualizing all the variations on the board like now that you know the right moves um, and let's right. say there's three, four variations and you have to find like, you know, five, six move lines, just looking at the board, knowing the moves and just visualizing them one by one so that your brain just gets a sense of what it would feel like to actually calculate this from, from scratch. Mm -hmm. Right. And what you'll find is like, okay, if you can, if your visualization can hold it, well then it, that's, that's good to know. Then it's like, okay, you, you have the capability, you just need... Now it's just a matter of finding finding the right line, like spotting the idea, which of course is a, mm -hmm. a whole nother story, but at least you know your visualization is good enough to find a lot of these ideas. Yeah. Um, all right, well, let's... Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's end it there. Hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, thanks a lot. I Absolutely. really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for joining. Uh, I'll talk to you soon. Keep me posted on your progress. Okay, thank you. All right, see ya. All righty, guys. Uh, that's going to wrap it up for the stream. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the lesson. I thought it was pretty uh, pretty cool a bit slower pace but like i think in a in a good way we touched on some uh some deep stuff uh so yeah i think that'll be it for the stream um let's see what are we doing i'll be back tomorrow with some more training and then we have um our big eu versus north america match coming up uh, on sunday so that's going to be at 12.30 p.m. So make sure to join the uh, the Discord if you haven't already and you want to sign up to play in a rapid team match. That's just open to everybody. Uh, there's info posted in uh, the announcements channel and the schedule channel. Uh, and we also have another sub battle coming up against Anna Rudolph this Sunday uh, that we're going to need a couple of boards for. So if you want to sign up for that, there's the uh, arena link in the chat so you got to join arena you got to sign up for our dojo club uh, you got to get like your twitch and your chess.com verified and then you have to register for the sub battle if you can play it's starting at 10 30 well, that should say a.m actually not 10 30 p.m one sec let me <laughs> fix the move bot um, if you can play at 10 30 a.m then let us know at 10 30 a.m 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 <laughs> morning time <laughs> and uh yeah i'll be posting players for that um probably by saturday or sunday again in the discord so that's the main way to uh to sign up for stuff uh all right yeah that's gonna do it for today uh, let's find channel to raid. And uh, if you missed the lesson, there will be the VOD available. It might also go up on our second YouTube channel where we put uh, streams on. All right, who's streaming?
<laughs> yeah, just finishing. Um, there is a second YouTube channel. You can find it linked on a regular YouTube channel. Also down below, we have two YouTube buttons. And there's a second one that has some of our longer streams. All right, we're going to raid a Japanese tutor. It's like he's doing some kind of lecture. So, uh, yeah, drop him a follow. He's a nice guy. Tell him the dojo says hello. And I'll see you all uh, next time. Take care.